This lesson is looking at some pieces of the hypothesis test. So we're going to look at traditional hypothesis testing, but this lesson isn't going to do any of the calculations. It's just going to look at what are the pieces that we put together to make a full hypothesis test. So a hypothesis test in statistics is using a sample to determine if the results are significantly different than the claim. So in order for this to work, we're assuming the sample is unbiased so that it will give reliable results. <clears throat> and we're looking at probabilities, so how likely it is for that sample to be different from the claim. So there's a few pieces that we use in these formal tests. So the first thing is what we call the hypothesis itself. And we label hypotheses as either being a null hypothesis or an alternate hypothesis. So a null hypothesis is some claim that involves equality. It can be just straightforward equals. For instance, we could say something like the mean equals 12 kilopascals. It could involve equals but also involve greater than or less than. So it could be something like the proportion is less than or equal to 17%. Or we could go the other direction, it could be greater than or equal to. So hypotheses can be about a lot of different things. The first ones we will look at are hypotheses about the mean and hypotheses about the proportion. So the alternate hypothesis is a statement that's exactly contrary to these ones. So an alternate hypothesis can be that the mean is not equal to a particular value. Or it could be using less than or greater than. So notice when it does have less than or greater than, it's not less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, it's just less than or just greater than. So when we look at the claim that we're trying to test, it could be either of these. It could be the null hypothesis or it could be the alternate hypothesis. So for example, we can look at a few statements and decide which one they are. So this first statement, according to the 2011 wage survey, Albertans in the Geological and Mineral Technologists and Technicians Occupational Group earned on average 28.17 an hour. So first of all, what's the claim about? And you'll notice I've highlighted average. So the claim is about a mean. And it just says they earned. So there's our other keyword there. So earned is not telling us more than, less than. It's just saying this is the amount. And is is a good way of saying equals. So that one is going to be that the mean equals 28.17 per hour. So that one would be a null hypothesis because there's equality in there. If we look at the next example, we have Incana has acquired more than 15 new well licenses per month in the last five years. Well, more than tells us we're looking at greater than. So this one would be an alternate hypothesis. Again, it's about the mean, right? Because it's our value per month. At most, 9% of rural water wells are affected by oil and gas drilling. So we've got a percentage there. This one's about a proportion. At most is telling us less than or equal to. So again, this one's a null hypothesis because we've got an equal to. So although that less than is in there, the equal to is also in there. So that tells us it's a null hypothesis. Anytime we're testing a null hypothesis, we're deciding whether it is true or false. But as I mentioned, we're using a sample. So there's always a chance that the sample, for whatever reason, ended up particularly lopsided. So there's two types of errors we need to keep in mind that could happen. The first type is called a type one error, rejecting a true null hypothesis. And the probability of that is symbolized with alpha, the first Greek letter. 
and it's called the significance level. So this is similar to what we were using with our confidence levels in the estimation unit. The type two, accepting a false null hypothesis is symbolized with the second Greek letter beta. And these two values are related to each other and to the sample size. So as the probability of a type one error goes up, the probability of a type two error goes down. So when you're deciding on that value for alpha, part of what you're thinking of is, well, what are the consequences for the different types of errors? And sometimes it's a minor consequence for one and a more significant consequence for the other. So you wanna choose your alpha accordingly when you're doing your calculations. And either one of them could be the one with the more significant issue. And those significant issues raise a range from if you get this wrong, someone might sue you to if you get this wrong, someone might die. So making those decisions definitely depends on the situation. Some other terms in formal hypothesis testing that we need to look at is the test statistic and the critical region. So the test statistic is whatever sample values that we're using to make the decision. And the critical region is the statistical values that would cause us to reject the null hypothesis. So note on these, we are always deciding reject or do not reject the null hypothesis and then making a conclusion about our particular claim. So if we look at that critical region, again, we're using a sample, so central limit theorem comes into play here. So we're using normal distributions. So we have three possibilities. If our null hypothesis is equal and our alternate hypothesis is does not equal, we get the two-tailed test that looks a lot like what we used in estimation. If our null hypothesis has a greater than or a less than involved in it, then we're looking at left or right tailed. And I like to look at these ones from the perspective of H1, right, our alternate hypothesis, because it's like an arrow that points to the tail. So if we look at that, right, we have right here, we basically have a right arrow and a left arrow from those two things, right? This one's pointing right, this one's pointing left. So it tells us where our critical region is um, and that critical region is equal to that significance level, right? The probability of that critical region. So that's in our diagrams, that's going to be our alpha. So on the two tailed tests, we end up dividing alpha by two. We're gonna do a couple examples where we just look at the claim, decide if it's left or right tailed and not do any of the calculations yet, but just look at how we would set up our original hypothesis. So the first one again is that one with the uh, group earning on average 28.17 an hour. So we already said earlier that if we put that in symbolic form, it is mu equals 28.17 an hour. And we also said that that is going to be our null hypothesis. So the alternate hypothesis is always opposite to that. So when we look at that, if we wanna say the opposite statement, well, it does not equal. And as far as left, right, or two-tailed goes, well, equals and does not equal is going to be a two-tailed test. Look at our second claim. At most, 9% of rural water, water wells are affected by oil and gas drilling. 
So symbolically, at most, is less than or equal to. So again, that's got an equals to in it. It's our null hypothesis. The alternate, the opposite of at most, is more than. So we'll use a greater than symbol for our alternate hypothesis. So since this one is less than or equal to for the null and greater than for the alternate, we're looking at a right-tailed test. The last piece we're going to look at is the conclusion that we would write once we have our statement once we have our calculations done. So we're going to skip over the calculations for the moment. We're going to come back to those in the next video. But for now, we're just looking at what would we do at the end given a particular statement and a particular set of calculations. So the wording of our hypothesis depends on whether we reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. But if the claim is the null hypothesis, we make our statements differently than if our claim is the alternate hypothesis because we're always rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. When we do reject it, we end up having a much stronger statement. And I've got a little flow chart here I'm going to share with you to look at our possibilities. Let's see if we can make that just a tiny bit bigger. Center it on the screen. Okay, so here's our flowchart. And if we're looking at this, it's saying, first of all, what we just did. Does the claim contain the condition of equality? So if it does, we say yes, and the claim is H0. If it doesn't, we say no, and the claim is H1. So that part's the same. The calculations allow us to answer this next question. So do we reject the null hypothesis? You'll notice it's the same question whichever direction we've gone. If we reject the null hypothesis, you'll notice I've put these in green. These are my strong statements. So if the claim is the null hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis, logic would dictate that means we're rejecting the claim. It makes sense. And so we have a pretty strong statement there. We're certain about this. There's enough evidence. If we say we do not reject the null hypothesis, well, the claim is the null hypothesis, so we're not rejecting the claim. But I'm going to point out that this is definitely a weaker statement because not rejecting something is not the same as supporting it. So be careful with your wording here. So when we say no to the rejecting, we're basically saying we don't have enough evidence. And the same is true if we went the other direction. If we say the claim is H1 and we reject the null hypothesis, well, rejecting the null hypothesis is saying the opposite is true. So in that is the case where we do end up saying we support the claim. So the only time we support a claim is when it's the alternate hypothesis. The only time we reject the claim is when it's the null hypothesis. So again, our other option is if we say no, we don't reject the null hypothesis. Again, we end up with that there's not enough evidence scenario. So we're going to use this flow chart as a learning tool, I expect you to be able to follow the logic eventually without the flowchart and just to be able to answer them. So going back to the questions. So we're going to look at some claims. We're going to draw a curve to show the test statistic in the critical region. And then we're going to write an appropriate conclusion given what we're told for these numbers. So if our test statistic falls inside the critical region, that shaded area on our diagram, then we reject the null hypothesis and write the corresponding statement. If it doesn't fall in there, we do not reject the null hypothesis and write the corresponding uh, not enough evidence statement. Okay, so let's look at this first one. We have engine oil 
given us viscosity and we're told we have 25 measurements taken and the values are given to us. So we'll learn how to do these calculations in the next video, but for now we're just going to accept that someone's done the calculations and let's look at how we would make a conclusion from that. So first of all, we have to make that decision as far as left, right, or two-tailed. So what's our claim? Well, it's that it has a viscosity, right? So there's no more or less than, it's just an equals. So we've got a two-tailed claim. And if we put those values on our diagram that were given in the question, we end up with something that looks like this. Mm, no, we don't, because it didn't copy over right. We'll get it there though. Okay, that's better. So this test statistic should be moved over a little bit. So our test statistic of 1.756 is going to be outside this critical value, plus or minus, so this side is the plus side, this side over here is the minus side. So we see it's not in the critical region. So our conclusion is going to say that there is not enough evidence. I like to say on these ones that the knots go together. So there's not enough evidence when it's not in the region. So in this case, our claim was the null hypothesis. So we're not rejecting the null hypothesis. We're also not rejecting the claim. Second example. To claim a set of low carbon steel pipes has a 10 cell strength of at least. So we've got that at least there. Our claim is greater than or equal to. And if it's greater than or equal to, the alternate is less than. So we're looking at a left tailed test. So if we take our diagram. it's going to look like a left-tailed test. So this time we're told our test statistic, the one with the TS here, is negative 1.955 and the critical value is negative 1.645. So if this is 1.645, 1.955 is going to be somewhere inside that shaded region. So let's get that drawn on here. inside the shaded region. We're going to put our line right about there. Got to move my critical value over. So that's the line right here. And our test statistic, that should be pointing more like there. So our test statistic is inside the critical region, so we don't have the knots this time. It is inside. We do reject the null hypothesis, which means our conclusion is going to say that there is enough evidence to reject the claim, because the claim is the null hypothesis. And our last example, the claim is that the time to remove paints from a set of items using a certain sandblasting method is less than 10 minutes. 25 measurements resulted in, and we'll give it again, a test statistic and a critical value. So our claim is less than 10 minutes. So less than is going to be an alternate hypothesis. And 
And because it's less than, that also tells us it's left-tailed. So if we have a left-tailed test, it's going to look similar to the one above. This time our values, our critical value 2.575, again, is going to be along that gray line. And our test statistic is going to be negative 2.955, so it's going to be inside the gray region. So let's get those labeled properly here. All right, so about right there. So again, we can see that is inside the critical region. So we're going to say reject the null hypothesis, but this time our claim is the alternate hypothesis. So if we're rejecting the null hypothesis and our claim is the alternate hypothesis, we're supporting the claim. In this case, the claim that the time to remove paint using the sandblasting is less than 10 minutes. Notice that when we write these statements, we are using the original wording from the question, right? If our claim is certain sandblasting methods is less than 10 minutes, when we write our statement, we're also using that exact same phrase. So use that to make your life a little easier. Use the flowchart while you're first doing these, because this is probably the part that takes people the longest to figure out. So use that flowchart. Also, the earlier charts where we looked at when is it left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed, right? Use this, memorize it, you will get great at it.